Veterans Affairs and Procurement calls this public hearing to order. It is now 6.35 p.m. on Wednesday, September 14, 2016. Uh, I want to thank, thank uh, the Vice Mayor who is here this evening. Uh, and I want to int uh, introduce the uh, Senators that have joined us this evening. Uh, to my left is Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz. Uh, to his left is Senator Frank Gloss. To my right is Senator Mary Torres. And to her right is Senator uh, Nerissa Underwood. And I know I saw Senator Jimmy Spaldon here. Um, and I know that uh, Senator Tommy Morrison said that he was also going, he is a co-sponsor of the bills we're hearing tonight. I also want to recognize the presence of um, of course, Mr. Mike Borja, uh, the Director of Land Management, who has joined us this evening. Um, and so before I open it up for the Vice Mayor to um, give some give op uh, opening remarks, uh, I, wanna, I need to go through the preliminaries here. And, um, and so uh, notice of this public hearing was provided to the general public. Uh, senators, stakeholders, and the local media on August 31, 2016, satisfying the five-day notice, and September 2, 2016, satisfying the 48-hour notice. Thus, the meeting, this meeting meets the requirements of the open government law. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 4 p.m. on Monday, September 26, 2016. Please address the testimony to Senator Thomas Seattle, Chairperson of the Committee on Lands. Um, tonight's public hearing is the first of a planned series of seven public hearings to be held in Southern Guam. Uh, last week we were actually supposed to have that initial meeting in Santa Rita, but that was the day that the uh, GPA had to do some load shedding, and it just so happened that at the time that we had scheduled for uh, the public hearing over there in Santa Rita, the, uh, that particular area was scheduled for a power outage. And so the mayor had asked that we um, uh, postpone it. And we decided then to go ahead and, um, and hold that hearing here tonight, um, it, both with um, Agat and Santa Rita combined. Uh, the next meetings that we have uh, that will follow uh, is tomorrow we will go to Marizzo to the Senior Citizen Center. Um, next week on Monday in Rohan Community Center on the 20th, Talafofo, uh, their, their um, community center there. Um, on Wednesday the 21st, we're going to go to Jotnia. Uh, on the 22nd, we're going to go to Umatic. And then on the 23rd, uh, we will have a public hearing in the afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, for basically the general public. The, um, the, the objective here tonight, of course, is if you notice when you came in, there's two sign-up sheets. Uh, the sign-up sheet for residents of Agat and Santa Rita, uh, who we, you know, who, um, they're the people of the house and we want to give them the primary, uh, the priority to to voice their opinions on the two bills. And then the other sign-up sheet for our residents outside. I do want to recognize the presence of representatives of uh, Safe Southern Guam, uh, Dr. Diane Strong and Lasia, right? Who is also a resident of Agat. So you're on the priority sheet, okay? As a resident of Agat, <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're gonna uh, discuss tonight, and, and what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and just give a brief overview of the two bills that we're gonna introduce. And uh, then when, when we call up uh, for individuals to provide testimony, uh, you can go ahead and, and talk about both bills, uh, preferably in, you know, in a sequence of Bill 365 and 366. So the first one we're gonna have uh, here is 365. Uh, Bill 365. Bill 365 is simply establishes that uh, the law requires that when a land use application gets submitted to the Department of Land Management for uh, review and disposition by the Guam Land Use Commission, 
Uh, the application is given to a, a body called the Application Review Committee. And that committee is comprised of uh, representatives from Guam Water Works, Guam Power, Guam EPA. And they basically you know, provide their technical expertise, uh, uh, review, and provide their findings as to how this project, uh, this land use application, might affect uh, the particular area uh, in the vicinity. Um, and, but the law also requires that a, a public hearing be held in that municipality. Uh, take, for example, in Jonia uh, of, of for that, um, the, the Pago Bay Towers. But what, what happens in reality is that um, the village hearing is not necessarily always informed by the findings of the application review committee, the experts. And basically what they have there is, I guess, the, they, they just don't have the benefit of you know, the findings of that. And then the findings of the uh, village meetings and the ARC gets put together and it gets submitted to the, to the Guam Land Use Commission for final disposition. What we're doing here in Bill 365 simply says, before that village meeting occurs, the findings of the application review committee must first be provided to that uh, municipal planning council so that they can make an informed decision as to whether they want to support, whether they are in support of the project or not. Uh, and that's all that it does. It, it provides some delay, but it makes sure that that village meeting is an informed village meeting. The, ne the other bill uh, that we're going to be, uh, that this public hearing is about, is Bill 366-33, which proposes to impose a two-year moratorium on any development in the south with the exception of construction for uh, residential uh, uh, activity. So if I wanted to build my house, no problem, we can still go ahead and uh, and do that. But if there was going to be a commercial development, uh, Bill 366 basically imposes a two-year moratorium or until the Southern Development Master Plan is completed, whichever comes first. And it kind of makes sense. You don't want to go building your house while the architect and the engineers are still, you know, designing how that house is going to look. So in the same, in the same vein, uh, the um, the, the Southern Development Master Plan, which was a bill that was authored by Senator Tommy Morrison, uh, they've, they've got that uh, organized now, and they've got to start working on that. Um, and so, whichever comes first, either two years lapses, um, then the moratorium is lifted, or uh, hopefully that, that master plan is, is completed, and then we can go ahead and move on with our lives uh, for the next uh, two years. Now, uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, and um, ask the the vice mayor uh, to 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 give opening remarks, and and you can also go ahead and roll in your testimony uh, on the two bills. Um, we, we do have quite a number of people, however, uh, it was not clear when you signed up uh, whether you also want to give um, a written or oral testimony. So, uh, Lacia, did you want to give oral testimony? Okay. Um, Bill Cundiff, yes. Uh, Mr. Cost. Um, V.I.C. Vicente? No. Uh, then Mr. Um, uh, Conception? Uh, Conception Jamol, Jamoilin? Okay. Uh, and then we got Chris Farron. No, no oral testimony. Um, Mr. Regis or Pro Provence? Okay. Uh, Roy Gamboa? 
None? Okay. Uh, a Mr. Babalta? Tony, Tony uh, Babalta? Uh, let me for a person to what Tony Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll just go ahead and check you off and then you can opt out. Uh, and then I have, uh, I, think, I think that was all the people. Did I miss anybody that signed up? Okay. And then uh, Santa Rita resident Fred Conception? No. Oh. Oh, you signed up with the sheets. Okay. <coughs> so, Mr. Vice Mayor, if you, uh, if I may first, uh, Senator, do you want to? Okay. Buenasen uh, on behalf of the village of Agate, Mayor Carol Tamiyama, and myself, our AMPC, we'd like to welcome, of course, all the senators, Senator Nursa Underwood, Senator Mary Torres, Senator Tommy Morrison, Chairman, Senator Adip, Senator B.J. Senator Frank Bloss, as well as Director Mike Borja, and all of our concerned visitors and the villagers of Agate who are here in support of the bill. We would like to thank you for showing and sharing your interest within the bills for Bill 36533 three, and three, Bill 366-33, which will be held here. And, and we thank you for coming and listening and partaking in this discussion that will benefit the entire Southern uh, residents of Guam. I'm here tonight as the Vice Mayor of this beautiful and serene village of Agate, and also as a resident to testify wholeheartedly in favor of bills 365-33 and Bill 366-33. I believe that now is the time that we step back and we look forward and we create a voice for the southern villages of Guam, as now we have an entity called the Southern Development Master Plan Task Force. This task force has been organized and created to oversee, compose, review, research, recommend, and partake in the economic development of the most pristine and untouched land areas of southern Guam. We must allow this task force time and support to create an acceptable, reasonable, and implementable master plan for the southern development. We can all agree, I think, at this point that we want growth and expansion for our villages. However, it's in my opinion that we must coincide with the needs of our residents and of all our visitors. The growth and expansion, however, must not, must not be below standards or a hit or miss type of development. It has to be a development, I believe, that is fully vetted and reviewed by its constituents of the impacted villages and all concerned entities and agencies. The expectation of the development must be clear, concise, and beneficial for generations to come. Therefore, placing a moratorium on big developments until a master plan has been developed and accepted is the right thing to do, in my opinion. Bill 366-33 does exactly this. I believe it puts the brakes on future developments before it crashes head on with our true desires and wants for our villages. Bill 365-33 is another important step in the process of being transparent and allowing for our villagers to be the true stakeholders in the development of their respective villages. After all, who knows their villages better than those who live in them? Who knows the views of both the elder and the younger generations of that village than their mayor? Vice Mayor and Municipal Planning Council members that work hand in hand with their residents each and every day. We need to make the mayors and vice mayors and the Municipal Planning Council members of their respective villages be an important part of the Application Review Committee of the Guam Land Use Commission. I believe now is the time that we should all listen, but most importantly respect the voices of the villagers that may be affected as well as the voices of our mayors, vice mayors, and municipal planning council members of every single village. It hits very close to the home here in Agate, where we've almost seen a 15-story building uh, erected here uh, without too many concerns or any type of um, uh, public input or, or whatsoever. And I believe that this is the time now, I think, that you know this bill, I think, is in support of, of, uh, of this. And that's why, you know, I, I, we are, including the mayor and myself, we are, we're in total support of these bills. And we applaud Senator Tom Adda and, of course, Senator uh, Tommy Morrison for introducing and co-sponsoring these proposals, which finally recognizes that Southern Guam is just as important as anywhere else on the island, and it has its developments that need to be done, but in the most beneficial way for its residents. 
Uh, also, for recognizing that the vice mayors, the mayors and the vice mayors and its MPC members should have a say in what happens in their respective villages. So once again, on behalf of Mayor Carol Tayama, myself, our entire village of Agate and our MPC, we thank you for holding this meeting down here and allowing us to um, hear and listen to what the bill has more to entail. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Um, before I go further, I, I, I do need to recognize a few more people. The, the, vice, uh, the Speaker of the Guam Legislature, of course, has joined us this evening. Uh, thank you, Speaker, for joining us. I also want to recognize uh, former Lieutenant Governor uh, Kaleo Moylan. Oh, that's not Kaleo Moylan. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's Oliver Verdalio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, I don't feel too bad. And then, of course, um, former Under Secretary uh, Tony Babalta, thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, so thank you very much for your testimony, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Susuko. Uh, I'd like to call up next uh, uh, Ms. Lasia Casil. And uh, Mr. Kande, if you can also join uh, Ms. Casil at the table. And. Um, follow up with after her testimony. Ms. Cassell, please go ahead. Good evening, good evening Senators. Um, my name is Lassie Cassell and I'm the founder and chairwoman of Save Southern Guam. Um, Save Southern Guam, we're a grassroots movement advocating the protection of the seashore and coastal beauty of Southern Guam. Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, for the attention that you have given to the issue of responsible development uh, in our southern villages. We appreciate your effort to engage with the people in our villages on a matter that will affect uh, our lives and our families', families lives forever. Um, we believe that setting this two-year moratorium until a southern master uh, plan is created is a step in the right direction to guiding our growth and development. The most precious resource we have in the south is our unique and beautiful landscapes, the hills, the mountains, the bays, um, the beaches, and the coastline. And if we allow unre unrestricted development, it will open the floodgates for giant monstrosities such as the Pago Bay Hotel and the Serena Hotel in Agate. We can't allow agencies such as the GLUC to continue granting random variance after variance without any guidance whatsoever. This is irresponsible behavior and not how communities are built. Just to clarify, Save Southern Guam, we're, we're not anti-development. Um, we are for responsible development. We feel that it's important to question these projects and who they will benefit and will they add any true value to our beautiful villages. And um, some of these pro projects come into question, especially when the audience that they're marketed to is overseas and some of the units are, you know are, are here costing half a million dollars like who is this project you know targeted to so we have reviewed your proposed bills 365-33 and 366-33 and the following are recommended changes um, that we offer on bill number 365-33 we ask that you incorporate language proposed in Bill 318-33 by Senator Frank Ogden Jr. and Senator Morrison, um, Section 1, Line 11, for each variance application, zone change, government lease, conditional use application, and other proposed project reviewed by the Guam, Guam Land Use Commission involving land in Guam, the relevant Planning Council of Guam's respective villages shall register its approval or disapproval with the Commission. No project shall be approved by the Guam Land Use Commission unless it has received the approval of the re relevant Municipal Planning Council. Um, and the following are recommended changes um, we propose for Bill Number 366-33. Um, the first one is um, add the municipality of Chalampago to Section 2-A. Um, the second change is um, we propose that you delete Section 3 in its entirety. Um, what is the purpose of filing for approval or disapproval if the legislature fails to take action within 60 days and the application automatically defaults to approval? 
this seems to us just like some loophole for getting something passed and defeats the purpose of the bill. Um, the third suggestion is to delete Section 4 in its entirety. Um, and our recommendation for Section 4 is any further actions by any board, administrative director, or employees of DLM, uh, DPW, GPA, GEPA, GWA, uh, and DPR that conflict with the provisions of this act shall make them collectively and or individually subject to the civil and criminal, criminal penalty, penalties prescribed by the laws of the government of Guam. Um, and also for section three, um, we recommend a temporary moratorium on the issuance of permits by the DLM, uh, DPW, GEPA, GWA, uh, GPA, and DPR. There shall be a temporary moratorium placed on the issuance of all permits to the muni municipalities of Santa Rita, Agate, Umatic, Mariso, Inarahan, Telefofa, uh, Zotnia, Chalampago um, for the next two years or, to, or until such a time a Southern Development Master Plan has been developed and approved, whichever comes first. Um, thank you, Senator Sidious Mwasi. Uh, for your time and efforts to include our input on these bills and coming down to speak to our villages. I just, sure. I just have one question. Yes. You, uh, you're recommending that Section 4, be, uh, which is the exemptions to the moratoria, be deleted in its entirety. And so that means then that for the next two years, if any resident wants to build a home, a residential home, that they are not to be able to build it. No, no, I, 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 then I, I recommended um, alternate wording. That was what I did. Alternate wording? Yes, no, it's section said. four. I, uh, okay. yeah. All right, I misheard you. I thought you said to, uh, to uh, delete section four in its entirety. And then add the following language. That's okay. what I, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions of Ms. Casil? All right. Okay. Um, Mr. Kandev? My name is Bill Kunder, I'm from Agate, and also a member of uh, Safe Southern Guam. Uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming down here this evening and uh, respecting us by having this hearing here in Agate and other villages of the things that concern us very much. So thank you so much for, for being here this evening. I support both uh, 365 and 366. So my testimony will, will go to the other one at the same time. For, for the longest time, we have been defending ourselves, defending our culture, defending our heritage, defending our, our ocean, defending everything after the fact. After development have been, have been uh, going on, now the people now are going to get involved. We have been defending us for the longest time and this should never happen. We should develop, we should work together as the process goes forward. It, it has less confrontation, it is less confrontational. <laughs> And I, I believe that even the developer would see where we're coming from uh, and what, what is it that concerns us. Uh, it, it's so important. Sustainable development, according to the UN, is a process for meeting human development goals while sustaining the ability of natural systems to continue to provide natural resources and ecosystem services upon the economy, upon which the economy and society depends. While the modern concept of sustainable development is derived mostly from the 1997 report, it is rooted in early ideas about sustainable forest management and 20th century environmental concerns. As the concept developed, it has shifted the focus on more economical development social development, and environmental protection. Sustainable, develop, sustainable development is the organizing principle for sustaining finite resources 
necessary to provide for the needs of future generations of life on the planet. It is a process that envisions a desirable future state of human societies in which living conditions and resources continue, resource use continue to meet human needs without undermining the integrity, stability, and beauty of the natural biotic systems. This is so important. This is in line, what you're trying to do is in line also with another UN uh, report which envisions this concept. I'm not going to go into what the name of the report is, but it's going to tell you some of the, some of the concepts. Developing and implementing policies that promote responsive, responsible, resilient, and sustainable tourism, inclusive of all people. Diversifying sustainable tourism through products and services, including large-scale projects with positive economic, social, environmental, environmental impacts, and the development of ecotourism, agritourism, and cultural tourism. Promoting policies that allow communities to gain optimal benefits from tourism while allowing them to determine the exact extent and nature of their participation. It, it is high time that our people participate in this process. If we don't, there's going to be more confrontational, it's going to be more confrontational, and we don't need this. We see this happening now at the Chalampago issue. Things are done first and then people were asked to participate later on. So, I, I, um, I, I appreciate Bills 365 and 366, and I hope that uh, it will be passed and we're on our way to to good sustainable development. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Babalta, did you still want to? <coughs> oh, Alessia, could you please provide a copy of your written testimony? The same with you, Mr. Kunda. Okay, thanks. Uh, provide it to the staff back there. Do you still want to provide some testimony? I have read the entire field here, but. My name is Antonio B. Babauta from Agat. Uh, I haven't read the, the entire view here, but being here in Agat, born and raised here, and I've seen the, the, uh, the movement of our vehicles on the island. And I think before we do any type of development in the southern, I think we should be able to try or look into the infrastructure to make sure that the infrastructures uh, sustain the population of the people here in Agat and also the people that will be be working in the whatever is being built here in the southern uh, master plan. Uh, Agat is also known to be a, a, a sleepy town, and I think it's time for us to wake up and uh, be able to have some sort of a development here in the southern area, being that we have such a beautiful uh, uh, places near that is close to the beach, and uh, especially down in Sedi Bay. I think uh, I think we need some. Uh, I think we need some uh, uh, southern improvement. And also, you will, you will benefit the people here in Agat because of the fact that if, if any improvement that is done here in Agat, uh, most of them will probably be uh, uh, be looking for a job, and it will be beneficial for them. And, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Babalta. If I could, I like to um, I like to just uh, ask uh, Mr. my staff, uh, Mr. Joe Bora, to just. Uh, give a brief overview uh, show, using an aerial map here as to really how um, uh, with respect to Santa Rita and Agate uh, where development uh, might be taking place. So uh, there's, the, uh, there's the aerial map that shows uh, Agate and Santa Rita. Yeah, 
there's an aerial photograph of uh, the Santa Rita area and Agat area. Uh, for a little bit of orientation, this is the Agat Catholic Cemetery here, uh, right by the ocean. And then you have the uh, Bordalio subdivision and the Hyundai subdivision. Then you have uh, Southern High. And uh, this is a Naval Magazine area. And this is the road that runs right to the village of Santa Rita and connects with uh, Route 4. Uh, you have a lot of vacant area up here in the hills, but uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, there is one single large landowner in the south that owns, uh, I'd say about maybe one-third, one-fourth of all the land in the south. The subdivision, uh, the areas that are mostly open for development would be these vacant areas, and these again are up in the hills. But also Santa Rita and Agat are uh, inherently different in their types of uh, communities, where Santa Rita is basically a uh, residential community. Agat has a basically a commercial strip uh, here, uh, and of course uh, the road around the island passes through, uh, passes through Agat. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, potential for development along that route, and uh, people show the one in the Pagancho area. This is the Pagacho subdivision, and uh, there are three big developments in Agat that maybe not even the residents know. The potential for development, this is the Agat Marina, this is the site of the proposed uh, Serena uh, Hotel with uh, uh, Mr. Longuero, Danny Longuero. Again, you have uh, Route uh, 2 here, and uh, that basically owns a commercial strip. It's not zoned as a commercial strip but a lot of the uh, uses are beginning to migrate down south of the village of Agat. Uh, this is the Pagalcho subdivision, uh, local housing by uh, Mura. And these lots here is one of the three uh, major developments in Agat that hasn't taken place yet. This is the former Umang land for the land of subdivision. The development that will take place on this would be according to the land trust uh, uh, programs that they have. Uh, there are problems in the area. You see some gaps in the area here. That's because there are streams going in the area. And this subdivision, of course, does not have, for the most part, any infrastructure on it. So that, if it does get infrastructure, you have the potential for maybe 60 homes, 60 families in that area. Uh, also, uh, further down south, one uh, tank. Okay, this is the water tank uh, down in Agat as you're going up towards the uh, solid waste transfer station. This again is an area open uh, uh, for development. It's also the site of the proposed southern sports complex. And uh, this area here, this is uh, West Santa Ana. It's a loop. Uh, recently the legislature passed a bill uh, appropriating $30,000 uh, for that area. Power line goes in halfway here goes in the other loop halfway there, but the middle part of the lot doesn't have power. Uh, with the installation of power in that area, uh, you could be opening up that area for 30 to 50 homes in that area. That's already been surveyed, subdivided. Uh, Tomorrowland Trust does have a master plan for that area. Uh, GPA is uh, following that master plan that the uh, Tomorrowland Trust Commission have prepared, and they will be installing a certain amount of infrastructure in that area. And again, this is the Agat Dramatic Road. Uh, the Santa Ana Chapel is right about here. And uh, there are two things in Agat that are, uh, you can consider Agat to be a host community, like in Iran and Ordo, host community for the dump of the landfill. Well, Agat has a very important infrastructure that comes into it, and that's the cable landing over by an international road of uh, Tata Communications and ICOM Communications. So in a sense, Agat is a, uh, host community for the internet services coming here and part of the Pacific wide uh, hub for uh, cables, <coughs> communication cables. And uh, and the other, um, the other, uh, the other um, infrastructure that they're hosting for the island, especially for the southern uh, part of the island, These are some of the projects, the Red Park, Southern Guam, 
these are one, some of the projects that are being uh, planned for uh, Agat and the southern villages. The one in Blue, Blue Marks, uh, the green boxes, the uh, sewer line improvements in this area, the Agat Santa wastewater treatment plant, and the sanitary uh, uh, evaluation uh, survey for this area. As some of the uh, testimonies presented is uh, let the uh, infrastructure uh, be adequate before you start any development. These are some of the things that GWA is doing in the uh, in the southern uh, the southern villages. Uh, one other thing, uh, the uh, Agat COTC lands. This is the uh, this is the municipality of Agat. The uh, properties in green are owned by the land trust. So in this municipality of Agat, this much. Uh, maybe about a good one quarter acreage of the total municipality of Agat is actually owned by the largest landowner in the south, and that would be the uh, Tomorrow Land Trust Commission. Developable? Uh, developable with uh, infrastructure, but not as much as you would see here as most uh, residents of Agat. You know, these are up in the hills. Uh, you have problems with erosion, you have problems with uh, access roads, and of course, there's no infrastructure up in there. All right. Thank you very much. Um, there's there's a couple more uh, that I overlooked um, that I've signed up. Uh, Agate resident Gerard Terlahi, uh, and then um, Dr. Diane Strong. Uh, you also wanted to provide a written testimony, um, so you can step forward. And Mr. When Mr. Terlahi is done, you can go ahead and proceed. Half of the senators and welcome again to Agat, our very competent vice mayor. I'm sure did a good speech. Uh, I also, my name is Gerard Terlahi. I am a resident of Agat, and as well, I'm also with the um, the Agat Municipal Planning Council. So I'm a little cognizant of some of the details. Uh, I didn't know everything on the bill. I reviewed a little bit. I am, I am in support of both bills 365 and 366 with a couple of recommendations. So uh, first with 366, uh, recommendation um, with the moratorium, moratorium, a two year effect, um, I would propose that thereafter that the moratorium be uh, applicable through a general election by the precincts respectively. So for instance, um, if the um, if there is a no, let me take that back because it, it's just a concept. So uh, the moratorium uh, and then by the, for instance, if the general election um, upcoming could continue per municipal municipal um, village respective area so if the villagers want it to continue uh, so let me uh, also just uh, qualify this with because there is no master plan that this is definitely needed we need a moratorium lack of this master plan you know uh, things are going to go um, anyway so anyway and and that thereby leading to uh, uh, confusion, a lack of, uh, you know, competent planning. So because there's a lack of a master plan, there is no master plan in place that I'm proposing that the moratoria for two years, I, I do support, but that their respective, uh, for the Southern master plan, you know, uh, because there is none, and until that is completed, it might take more than two years, but it's only two year moratoria, right? So the um, effect of a continuance of the moratorium by general election. Uh, I don't know how to put that in place, but um, it's something for consideration. Okay, uh, Bill 365. Um, 
Prior to the, um, the Guam Land Use Commission through their uh, municipal planning hearing process, I, I understand that's what the bill is. So they can't conduct a hearing, the municipal planning hearing, until the M uh, respective MPCs, mayor's office, receives the complete um, report, the completed report. What I'm recommending here is that why don't the respective municipal uh, um, that's affected be a participant and not necessarily uh, be uh, being able to hinder any process, but at least be cognizant, you know, be uh, aware so that the information is not just a one shot, we get it now, now we have to review it and process this and comprehend this, but if we had some <coughs> forefront of information that the, not to say that, you know, that we'll know exactly what to do, but we may have better opportunities to respond accordingly. So those are the two recommendations I have uh, for the respective bills. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Talai. Does anybody on the panel have any questions? None? Okay, Dr. Strong. Join us in half a day. I am a resident of Jonia and a 44-year resident of Guam. And thank you for this opportunity. I want to address, as a case study, the Pago Bay Towers to help the people who are attending tonight get a little feeling for a process that, in this case, didn't work really well. It began with the ARC meeting. Now, picture the ARC. Those are the people from the most important infrastructure agencies. We're not talking about Department of Education, I'm sorry. They're not permanent members of the ARC. The Mayor's Council has no representative on ARC. So we're talking appointed directors, directors appointed by the governor, and employees of those agencies working for their directors, so that we're clear on that, correct? The ARC is chaired by land management's chief planner. So again, we don't have an unbiased person there. Um, in October of 2015, the Pago Bay proposal went to the ARC. I have the minutes. The chief planner was very biased, pushing toward approval of this project, which is the second phase in Pago Bay. I'm going to ask you to refrain from characterizing the, you know, all okay. those people. I apologize. Okay. Then the position statements are issued, and none of them are black or white. They're saying. If you wear a pink hat and orange shoes on a Tuesday, we will approve. So eight pages of conditions are generated. And the position statements are not timely. The emails go out. We need that position statement just as they're going to be needed in continuing this process, regardless of what weight we are giving, whether it's more weight for municipal planning agencies, etc. The deadline is very difficult to meet. Then it goes to a public notice for the village that is most affected. Unfortunately, it's in the municipality of Jonia, but it affects Chalampago more than Jonia. So the public notice appeared as required by law on the day after Christmas, December 26th, and if the pink highlighter were not there, I don't think most people would have seen that. And we did not see that. And there was no second public notice two days before the January 7th public hearing in Jonia. The public hearing was not as beautifully organized as this public hearing. There were more than 100 people there. We're not quite sure who controlled the meeting. It was not orderly like this. Finally, it, after the public hearing, it goes to the GLUC. 
the GLUC entertained that application for three public hearings. The decision was made in May. Before the public hearing, this was available at uh, Jonia Pub Mayor's Office and Chalampago, but we didn't know about it. And we don't know how we're going to know that we should look at this great big application that only has an eight-page short form of the environmental impact assessment approved by Governor Carl Gutierrez in 1999. Shouldn't a project as big as two towers, 11 and 12 stories, which are conditionally approved, but they wanted 15 and 14, shouldn't that require the same kind of EIA that the military, that we required, with all those wonderful scoping meetings that we attended? We think so. We think there's a real problem with that executive order from 1999 because the developer fills it out and checks. No impact on wetlands, no impact on traffic, no impact on infrastructure. And that's a legal document. It says under perjury, under you know force of law, that those statements are correct. So the conditional approval, eight pages of conditions by the ARC members. Then we move ahead in August, a permit is issued by GEPA, as required by the GLUC. Before construction be begins, you will be doing test borings for the foundation. We want to have a strong structure, unlike the Royal Palm Hotel in Tamooning, which had to be imploded one month after the earthquake. Um, at one month after opening, Guam's strongest earthquake damaged that hotel. Thank heavens nobody perished in that. Amazing when two floors collapsed. So these kind of tests are very important. However, the drilling permit, which is issued by the water resource management people at EPA, had three pages of conditions. And Save Southern Guam from the very beginning has said it's all good well and good to care about our environment, our infrastructure, our impacts, but we need the government agencies to be able to enforce. We have always been weak on enforcement. So on the first day of the drilling, somebody violated the private property rights of the developer and went to the site and photographed the permit which was in the pickup truck supposed to be published, it's supposed to be showed uh, to the public on the access area. Then this individual went to EPA and said, there is no hydrologist on site from Water Energy Research Institute. And that person filed a complaint asking for a notice of violation. Long story short, EPA changed the permit language, reissued an amended permit. End of enforcement. These bills, once polished, will offer residents a stronger voice at the village level, at the southern level. These bills will improve the transparency of our agencies because if it's here in our village, we can see that they're in the wetlands or right next to the wetlands. And where is the Army Corps permit? You're right next to a navigable river. So this is just a very short case study on a problem, a project, which we think went horribly wrong. And the only redress is to go to court. Uh, maybe you people are a little bit richer than we members of Save Southern Guam, and I think Speaker, Vice Speaker BJ knows how long litigation process is. So again, if the law doesn't let you just go to the legislature because it's a variance, it's not a zone change. So Save Southern Guam, really thank, thank you for caring about these problems, Centers, we really need a master plan. We need 
in the master plan for the stakeholders, but who are we developing Guam for? Not just for outside investors. And Save Southern Guam is not anti-development. We are here for responsible development. So I thank you. Ms. Casill offered our approved testimony amendments to both of these bills with addition from Senator Uggins, Bill 318. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that exhausts our, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gamboa. Uh, you also wanted to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Strong. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Roy Gamboa. I'm also a resident of the village of Agate. Uh, to make things rather quick here, I am in support of uh, 365 and 366 uh, as written. Uh, one suggestion, uh, it was already brought up in Mr. Chalahi here to, uh, I guess, discuss an extension of the uh, moratorium uh, beyond 24 months. Uh, in my honest opinion, I think if we add those extensions, it's just kicking the, the bucket down the road. Uh, it allows the task force to basically drag their feet. Um, I would suggest that uh, in order to move the task force forward, that if a the moratorium have some type of verbiage that indicates that there is a two-year time limit on this, and this, again, is not uh, counterproductive. Rather, it is to help speed along the task force uh, to create and develop this master plan. Uh, the people that have been appointed to this task force are highly educated, you know, uh, city planners, village planners, and whatnot, that I feel that in 24 months is more than adequate time for them to develop a southern master plan. Uh, furthermore, I think the task force is limited uh, not only by numbers, uh, therefore I suggest uh, in discussion there that the task force be opened up to the municipal planning councils of each village, that they take part um, and also have open forums similar to this, uh, so that way the input is not coming from individuals that are appointed um, and rather also include the uh, municipal planning councils of each of the villages uh, as indicated in the uh, plan. Also, I'd like to touch on emergency government projects. Uh, should that arise in the next 24 months, is there anything in there that stipulates that uh, in this bill uh, that we would allow for, for instance, uh, drastic erosion, uh, for instance, down here in southern, uh, uh, down at Nimitz Beach? Uh, we lose about a foot of land and sh uh, sorry, uh, shoreline just about every year. Um, I'd like to see move forward either by grants or any other means to help uh, similar to what was done down at, in Lahan, uh, in Etnun Gef Pago with the border to protect the shoreline. Uh, if those types of projects are brought up, uh, can that also be allowed to proceed uh, during the moratorium? Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead, Senator. Since uh, Senator Morrison was a co-sponsor of these bills, and he was also the... Uh, sponsor of the bill that introduced the, uh, the uh, Southern Development Master Plan uh, legislation. I'm going to go ahead and have him address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, first off, I, 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 uh, to answer the, the question regarding the expansion of the task force uh, uh, within the, uh, the statute, the governor has the authority to expand that uh, task force uh, as needed uh, and recommended by uh, each respective uh, uh, village community down in the, the southern community. So uh, that uh, provision is uh, within the statute. So we can definitely look to that to expand uh, the, the task force. Um, the I, I want to make it very clear that um that you know i don't want to take all the or take this uh, credit that uh put before me regarding the southern development master plan uh there was a lot of four thinkers uh within the southern community or specifically in in agate uh, uh senator rivera um in 1988 working closely with uh his colleagues and and, and governor ada uh, worked very closely to to um, understand that uh, the southern communities needed to to be addressed, uh, seeing that they were in that time uh, 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 large scale 
uh, proposed uh, projects that were being discussed and uh, those um, uh, those issues were being addressed and many of the issues that we've been talking about were being addressed if we, if we look back into the, the statements that were being made at that time um, uh, for some reason the, the momentum uh, died in moving forward with the plan and you know uh, uh, working closely with my, uh, the chairman and the committee here uh, we, we wanted to revive uh, the Southern Development Master Plan Task Force and the, 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 the change that we made, uh, the change that we made that, that I believe was very significant is including our, our, our village mayors and vice mayors and um, to ensure that, you know, uh, as we go, as we're doing right now, uh, going village to village, um, addressing these measures, we'll be doing the same thing with the Southern Development Master Plan to, to educate and bring awareness to how uh, we want to grow our southern communities. How does Aga want to grow? How does Umatic want to grow? Malesu and so on. And, and in, in being consistent with uh, the public law, if you have time, look at public law 19-38 and, and there's a whole list of guidelines on how uh, that plan is to be uh, developed. And, and I want to ensure that everyone get it, uh, be educated on that as we move along uh, with that, that, that project. Um, it's clear that we have, and we thank the vice mayors and mayors that are here and that, are, are, uh, and that, that we have already met with a meeting with the mayor's council to ensure that we, we uh, uh, as uh, this moratoria of this legislation passes, that we have the, the timeline, or it, it kind of incentivizes the pro process to, uh, to, to move forward with the, the plan and, and to ensure that those guidelines are followed. Um, development doesn't necessarily mean a, a hotel in everyone's backyard, but if you look at the, uh, what's defined in the guidelines as it talks about agricultural needs, uh, tourism, uh, of course the capacity upgrades infrastructure, all, all the, the list is there to ensure that we guide this plan uh, importance and uh, and with the input of these communities, or our southern communities. So uh, please look out for a schedule of um, uh, events to take place uh, with respect to the Southern Development Master Plan and, um, uh, and ensure that uh, you get educated upon the Public Law 19-38 and, and ensure that when you come, you come to the table that your input um, with the task force is, is, is embedded in or ensure that it's in this plan. Um, I want to thank the chairman. We've been working very closely uh, uh, to, uh, as we had the Southern Development Master Plan uh, address, we want to ensure that the, the moratoria is a, uh, a measure that would definitely help move the process along a lot more quicker. We just don't want to see what happened in 1988 and 1990 uh, that there was a lot of, uh, just from what I've read, a lot of, a lot of excitement at that time to to move forward, and I just don't want that to. I, wanna, I just don't want to see that happen again. So this, this measure is very critical to, to moving that plan forward. It works uh, hand in hand. Uh, uh, with the ARC, uh, I've been uh, instrumental in that process as a former director of the Bureau of Stats and Plans, so I understand working closely with the chairman uh, where the dis disconnects could be uh, with our village communities um, and, and, and how uh, certain I issues as brought up in testimony regarding position statements as they trickle in and how soon they get into the hands of our mayors before they uh, provide uh, or develop their resolutions in support or in non support of the measure. And, and sometimes they just don't have all position statements before them before they proceed to developing uh, their resolutions uh, with their MPC. So I, I definitely understand that and I thank the chairman and the committee to ensure that uh, uh, that but with the addition of something else and I didn't catch it and I would I was wondering if that would be okay with you Mr. Chairman just that portion uh, uh, you, you can go ahead. sure you can go ahead and step forward and repeat that testimony however you do have it in writing yeah, yeah. 
and, and I did, um, you know, my thing. Turn, my, on, my turn on your mic, then. please. I did read over my notes again, and I misread. I, I, the third recommendation was delete section 4A. 4A? Yes. Oh. So that was my mistake. I apologize. So we would keep 4B, which um, okay. the exemption for the homes. Yeah. Okay. okay. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you for your recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Torres. Okay, so there being uh, no other testimonies or questions, uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and adjourn. Uh, yes, Mr. Kunder. Can you please step forward? Just, just take the mic over to him. Since this is a uh, very important process and affects a lot of people in the South and other places, can we have a web page to put all the 19-8 in there and all the things being going on so we, c we can review this as time goes by? It's a, it's a lengthy process and we need to educate ourselves and it's very difficult to go down to the legislature and look at all of this. But if you create a web page that we can review all the time on the ongoing uh, testimonies or whatever they are, uh, I would appreciate that. Okay, good, good recommendation. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, we'll be um, we'll be adjourning this particular hearing tonight. Uh, tomorrow we go to uh, Maritzo. Um, I'm sure we'll be staying behind a bit, make ourselves available if anybody has questions uh, about anything else. Okay. So this uh, meeting is adjourned.